Good morning. Welcome to the service this morning. Give you a warm welcome on this uh, actually really beautiful Sunday, sunny morning. It's great to be able to meet together. Um, we're going to sing now and then we're going to have uh, the reading and prayer before we sing again and then we have the sermon. So let's sing praises to God, shall we, this morning. We might be small in number, but we're encouraged to to sing. So let's stand and have our first hymn, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing.
uh, as I said, we're going to read from God's Word, and we're continuing um, our look, and we actually come pretty much to the end of chapter 7 this morning. Um, I'm not going to read uh, verse 53, because um, the thought is that that's tied in more with chapter 8, so I'm going to read from John chapter 7, I'm going to start reading at verse 40, and uh, read through to the end of verse 52. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers who came to the chief priests and Pharisees, who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd does that, that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arrives from Galilee. Amen. Let me continue, or let us continue to, to worship God, shall we, as we turn to him in prayer this morning. Almighty God, sovereign God, our Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for your, your many blessings. We thank you for this morning that you've given us breath to breathe. And Lord, that you've given us the, the desire to meet together in your name. And Lord, we thank you that we've already sung your praises. We've already been reminded of your goodness to us and of your saving power in the Lord Jesus in song. Thank you too, Lord, for the, the reading of your word. And Lord, we pray that through your Holy Spirit, you will open our eyes, you will teach us from your word, even this morning. Father, we, we do pray for, for those who aren't here this morning. Lord, for those who are unwell, for those who are suffering, Lord, for those who are mourning. And Lord, we pray that you will draw close to each one that you will strengthen, that you will heal, that you'll comfort. And Lord, that you will help us to be people who are equally following your example in being good witnesses, good friends, good comforts, sharing the good news of the Lord Jesus with our, with our friends and our families, Lord, and with strangers, whoever you, uh, you bring across our path. So we do commit one another to you this morning. Pray, Lord, that you will strengthen our faith in the Lord Jesus. And draw us closer to him, we pray. We think too, Lord, of the conflict, especially in Ukraine this morning. We pray for those who are really suffering, Lord. We think of those who have already uh, been injured and killed and their families left behind. Lord, we pray that you will overrule in that situation, that you will bring peace, that you'll bring an end to conflict. Lord, that there will be justice. Lord, we pray for your people in Ukraine. We thank you for them. We thank you for the, the amazing work that they're doing in, in helping, bringing humanitarian aid, but also being able to share the gospel, even in, in war. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've miraculously protected some of them, many of them. And Lord, we pray that you will continue to, to use your people for good in, in that place. Pray for the, the people and the churches in Russia too, and we commit them to you realizing lord the the very real persecution that the churches and your people face there and we commit them into your care too lord we just pray that you will give much wisdom to yes to the ukrainian parliament and president but also to to ours here in the uk and, and other um, countries when they consider what should be done what needs to be done lord that you will 
that you will help them to make good, wise decisions. Lord, forgive us that perhaps in many cases we seem to have turned our back on, on our fellow brothers and sisters, but more importantly, Lord, so many people have turned their back and countries have turned their back on you. And so, Lord, we do cry out that you will be merciful, that you will move through your Holy Spirit once more and draw, draw countries back to yourself. Even um, with so many going through war, Lord, we just pray that you will draw people to yourself. And so, Father, we do pray for the country and the town that we live in, the village that we live in, Lord. We pray for our friends and our families who don't know you. Lord, pray that you will, you will save them, that you will um, draw them and bring them to, to bow the knee to the Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for um, those that we are supporting abroad, those who are working for you, those who are missionaries in, in many different situations and, and cultures and countries. Lord, we pray that you'll bless them. Pray, Lord, that you'll help them in their, in their work. Make them a blessing uh, and a light to the, the people they're trying to reach for you. So, Father, we, we come before you this morning with much gratitude of heart. And pray, Lord, that you will help us to worship you uh, as we glorify your name together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Before we come to the, the sermon, we're going to sing again. Um, let's sing, Blessed Be Your Name. As I said at the beginning, we're, we're continuing our, 
Um, our look and, and really finishing John chapter 7 this morning. Again, it's been a while, um, but it's been amazing to, to really um, get into, into detail with God's Word, hasn't it? And this morning, before I really start at verse 40, I want us just to remember, because it's been a while, what, what happened in verses uh, 37 and 38, if you remember. Remember that we have, um, it's the festival of, of booths, of tabernacles, and, and it's at the, towards the end of that on the last day that Jesus stands up and he cries out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has says, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. And that's really the point that we then pick up this, that I want to look at this morning. Because as, as Jesus puts that cry out, remember that the synagogue will be full, Jerusalem will be full with, with Jews from all countries all over the world coming to, to celebrate and to take part in this, this festival, this joyous time. And Jesus has then put out this this invitation for people to come to him and to drink if they're thirsty. So I suppose that the follow-up question to that is, so what happens next? What happens next with the, with the crowd? What happens next? How, how will they respond to this, this amazing invite? What was their reaction? Well, as we, as we read and as I read through it, it just becomes more and more obvious yet again that yes, there was continued confusion with the, with the crowd. And some of the, the answers that the crowd are or, or discussing by themselves were, yeah, 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 he's, he's the prophet, the one who has been promised. Others went as far as to, to venture that in fact, he was the Christ. And yet others, well, there's always the others, aren't there? You know, the, really, the really argumentative ones who disputed the idea. And then you have the, the Jewish leaders and, and they wanted to, to arrest Jesus and they wanted to execute him. But, but the people they'd sent out, the, the officers they'd sent out to, to arrest Jesus, well, well, they came back empty-handed and they reported back in verse 46, never has a man spoken the way that this man speaks. And then, and then we have Nicodemus. Remember him? We, we met him back in, in chapter 3. He came to Jesus at night. And he was part of the Pharisees. He was a, a Pharisee. And, and as there's, there's this discussion going on with uh, the other leaders, he, if you like, tries to, to wind back, to calm them down, trying to stop them. You know, they, they were there with, with murderous intent. But he finds himself being rebuked. John, the, the gospel writer, sums up the, I suppose if you could say, the, the overall flavour of this section in, in verse 43, when he says this. So there was a division among the people over him, over Jesus. So there was a division among the people over him. So actually, not so much confusion this time, but division. Division. And, and when you start to consider what that means and what that looks like, I mean, do you ever think of Jesus as being dis divisive? Oh, oh, we like to think of, of Jesus' words like we will come on to eventually, God willing, in John 13, where where he says, you know, that by our love, the world will know that we are his disciples. And, or later on again in John 17, where we think of his prayer, that, you know, his followers would, would be unified so that the world would know that, that the Father had sent him. You know, you have this picture, don't you, of, of people, I don't know, joining hands and singing, bind us together, you know, sort of unity. Jesus and division don't seem to go together. 
But actually, Jesus himself said in, in Matthew 10, verses 34 and 36, he said this, Do not think that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father and a daughter against his mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a person's enemies will be those of his own household. And I think it's true, isn't it, that if we want to have a, a true perspective of who Jesus is, we must also consider, at least in part, uh, he is one who, who divides people. But I suppose the question then is, is why? why? Why does Jesus cause such division? Surely that's not why he came. Well, the real reason is because, because Jesus claims to be exclusively the truth. The truth. And by claiming, by claiming that exclusivity, if you like, that inevitably causes division among people. Satan hates the truth, and he hates the truth especially about the Lord Jesus. And so he makes sure that there are always many, often within churches, true, who oppose the truth. We see that throughout the New Testament um, in the pages of Acts, Acts 20, verses 29 and 30. Paul is having to, to warn the the Ephesian elders, he says this, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you. This is into the church, not sparing the flock. And from among you, from among your own selves will arise men speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. There'll be people who come in who claim to, to have special knowledge or claim this and claim that, who will distract from the truth so there, there will be division in the the passage that we just looked at or read earlier it shows how Jesus caused division both among the the religious people but also among the the religious leaders of his day in in verses 40 to 44 we see that it's the people it's the the people who are at the feast the religious people who were confused. And there's three different views that the crowd held to at that time. See, some had a correct but uh, inadequate view of Christ. For them, they said, this really is the prophet. And, and that phrase, if you like, that refers back to the, the prophet that, that Moses had predicted back in, in Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. That says this, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. And in Jesus' day, the, the common view was that the, the prophet and the Christ were two separate persons. And if you cast your minds back to, to John chapter 1, John the Baptist denies being the Christ, if you can remember. So what does the the delegation from Jerusalem ask him? Well, the follow-up question is, well, if you're not the Christ, are you the prophet? In John 6, verse 14, you remember Jesus had had fed the the massive crowds with with five loaves and two fishes. And and at the time, and and through those miracles and and Jesus' teaching, the, the crowd, the people started to join up the dots. And they started to think about Moses giving Israelites the, the manna in the wilderness. And, and they proclaimed about Jesus. This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. And remember, they, they wanted almost to take Jesus by force and to, to make him king. And he had to, to remove himself from them. Now, certainly Jesus... Jesus is the prophet of whom Moses spoke. He was much greater than Moses, both in, both in the signs that he performed and, and in the teachings that he gave. 
But by itself, to believe that Jesus was the prophet and just the prophet, that well, that's an inadequate view. A prophet, no matter how great, could, could not authoritatively claim what Jesus claimed. You know, that whoever would come and, and drink of him would have, would have rivers of living water gushing up from inside him and flowing out of him. No, only God in human flesh could make those sorts of claims. And there are many people, even today, yes, they, they think highly of Jesus. They like Jesus. They, they like his teaching. But they don't believe that he's God. They don't. They don't submit their lives to him as their Lord and their God. So yeah, they, they have a correct, but an inadequate view of Jesus. The next group, if you like, well, they had a correct, but uncommitted, I'll use that word, uncommitted view of Jesus. You see, in, verses four, in verse 41 in the first half, it says, others said, this is the Christ. And you hear that and your heart leaps, doesn't it? They've got it right. This is the Christ. They're, they're bang on. This is the God's promised one, God's anointed one. He's the redeemer, the king who would, who would reign on David's throne. And they bang on. They, they've got it right. And it's definitely a, a step up, if you like, from, from thinking that Jesus, thinking of Jesus only as being the prophet but it was an inadequate view too. Because as we read it, it doesn't reflect, it doesn't, they, the, the writing doesn't reflect any, any personal commitment or submission to Jesus as Lord and Christ. The text seems to indicate that they, they held their views, you know, as a, as a point of debate but not as disciples willing to follow him no matter what the cost. And the truth is so true today, isn't it? There are so many who say, I believe in Jesus as Saviour. But they don't live in submission to him as their Lord. They don't bow before him as king. A.W. Pink said this, Unless our hearts are affected and our lives moulded by God's word, we are no better off than a starving man with a cookbook in his hand. I thought, that's amazing. That's so true, isn't it? Let me read that again. Unless our hearts are affected and our lives moulded by God's word, we are no better off than a starving man with a cookbook in his hand. In other words... Just purely intellectual belief in Christ without the accompanying obedience to him is useless. Saving faith is obedient faith. The third group uh, for this crowd, well, they rejected Jesus' claim for... <laughs> just really ridiculous, flimsy reason that actually was an excuse. In verses 41 and 42, this group denied that Jesus was the Christ because, because they knew that Christ was not going to come from Galilee, but rather from the, the line and the city of David, from, from Bethlehem. And, and these critics, if you like, they, they took pride in their, their theological knowledge. They loved to, to point out their knowledge of the truth. Their, their logic was the Messiah doesn't come from Galilee. Jesus comes from Galilee. Therefore, Jesus cannot be the Messiah. And yet to, to hold that particular line of, of reasoning, these, these critics had to, to ignore so many or all of Jesus' many miracles probably many of which, at least some of which, they would have seen with their own eyes. They had to dismiss Jesus' teaching, which even, the, remember, the, the, uh, the arresting officers said that no one had taught like him. They had to, to shrug off, if you like, Jesus' astounding claims. 
just as the one he, you know, the one he had just issued, to be able to give rivers of living water to all who believe in him. But the truth is, the truth is, they weren't interested in believing in, in Jesus. If they'd been interested, they could have cleared up their confusion. They could have cleared up their, their question of where he originated from really easily. But they didn't want to. They didn't want to believe. They just wanted a, a comfortable excuse to reject Jesus. And they would have seized him if they could have, but they could not lay a hand on him because God is sovereign even over his enemies. So Christ caused division among, among these religious people. But also he caused division among the religious leaders in verses 45 to 52. And again, we, we encounter, if you like, three, three groups, three parties associated with these religious leaders. We have the, the temple guards. You know, they were impressed with, with the way Jesus spoke, but they were too fearful to believe. So th these temple guards, they would have been Levites. They came back from their, their mission to arrest Jesus in verse 32, empty-handed. So as they're reporting back to the, the chief priests and the Pharisees, they were asked, why did you not bring him? Why did you fail? You had one job, something simple. Just go and arrest Jesus, bring him to us. Now the guards, easily they could have said, well, he was surrounded by people. And, you know, and, and if we'd gone and arrested him, then, then it would have been a riot. And, and we wouldn't want that. Everyone would have been upset. But no, they don't go down that avenue. avenue. Instead, they admit in verse 46, no one ever spoke like this man. No one spoke like him. And the impression is that these temple guards were too fearful of the chief priests and the Pharisees to take a bold stand for Jesus. It would have meant their jobs. And so they just fade from view. In the same way, there are many, I think, in our day who are impressed by, by Jesus' eloquence or his wisdom. Oh, they think that he was a great man, a, a brilliant religious teacher. But they don't see him as the eternal word of God in, in human flesh. So they don't believe in him as their saviour and lord. And out of fear of what others think... They don't take a bold public stand of faith in Christ. And they just fade away. Then you have the Pharisees. And they were arrogantly disgusted with anyone, anyone who was favorably uh, towards, thought towards Jesus. The arrogance and the contempt that the Pharisees had for anyone who remotely supported Jesus is not disguised here. And they, they ask the, the temple officers, you have not also been led astray, have you? Even you, your Levites, your officers of the court, you've been led astray? Oh, none of us have been led astray. None of the rulers or the Pharisees have believed in him, have they? And then... And it's awful when you think about it. And then referring to the general crowd that was thronging the temple for the feast, the Pharisees arrogantly pronounced in verse 59, but this crowd, this crowd does not know the law, that does not know the law is accursed. Talk about a put down. John wants us to see that that it is really the proud Pharisees who are under a curse because the wrath of God abides on those who don't believe or don't obey him. By virtue of their, their position as religious leaders, it's the Pharisees who, who should have been loving, 
caring shepherds over God's people. Who, they are the ones who should have been teaching his word, binding up their wounds and leading by example in the ways of the Lord. Oh, but they show their true colours here. They despise the common people, the very people they're supposed to be pastoring. They despise people as a bunch of, oh, ignoramuses. Even when one of their own, Nicodemus, pointed out that they were, they were violating the, the law that they proclaimed to know by judging a man without having heard his case, what did they do? They reviled him as being a Galilean. Verse 52. These Pharisees lived in Jerusalem, the capital, and they viewed northern Galilee as a, you know, a bunch of, of ignorant, say, hillbillies for peasants from the sticks, didn't know anything, and what they knew wasn't worth knowing. They hated Jesus because he repeatedly confronted their hypocrisy and challenged their, their man-made traditions. He threatened their very power and their existence. He made them look bad in front of the crowds. So their pride blinded them to the truth about Jesus that their own scriptures testify to. And we see this sort of arrogance today, often uh, among supposed intellectuals who proclaim evolution as the only scientific view. You know, those who, who ridicule you if you believe in the Bible. You know, you believe crazy things. You're uneducated. Just the same approach um, as these Pharisees had. And then you got Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, he, he registered, if you like, a, a mild defense of Jesus. And he disagreed with his fellow leaders. But what happened? He got put down big time by them. Remember, it's Nicodemus who whom John reminds us here, had come to Jesus before. And he was one of them. He was a Pharisee. And what does he say? He says, does our law judge a man without first giving him a, a hearing and learning what he does? He says, y you're not even obeying your own law with, re with respect to Jesus. And what do they do? How do they respond are you from Galilee too? Really? You're supporting him? Have a look. Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Nicodemus is, a, is an interesting character, isn't he? Uh, as I was reading, there was a, f a few commentators argued that we can, we can never be sure that Nicodemus came to genuine faith in Christ. But most hold that his, his courageous act of helping Joseph of Arimathea bury Jesus that we come to later on in John 19. It indicates that he did finally believe. I think I go along with that version. But here at, at this point, we cannot be sure whether he, where he is in that process. He was at least sympathetic towards Jesus. And he was, he was concerned about the irrational hostility that he, he saw his fellow Jewish leaders having towards Jesus. And so he, he does register this mild, object, mild objection to their, their murderous intent. But when they vilify him as being, being a Galilean, it seems like he says no more. He could see that they, they weren't in the mood for, for rational discussion. But his point was valid. In contradiction of the law that they purported to uphold, they were judging a man without hearing his case. And also there, they're put down of him. Search and see that no prophet arises out of, Jews, of, out of Galilee. <laughs> that was incorrect. Jonah, Nahum. And perhaps other prophets had arisen out of Galilee. But they were so upset with the, the direction that they saw things were going that they weren't using sound reason, just illogical ridicule. 
So what can we what can we glean from these divided responses to Jesus, to his clear invitation that he's put out in verses 37 and 38? Well, surely here's, here's some for you to take away. The, the clearest gospel presentation in the world will not result in conversion unless the Holy Spirit opens blind eyes. Jesus gave the invitation and people got it wrong and they ignored it and they turned their back. Jesus here had not said anything, I don't know, gross or controversial like he had back in, in verse 6 about eating flesh and drinking blood. Oh, true, his, his claim to be able to cause rivers of, of living water to flow out from those who believe in him was a, was a clear claim that only God himself could make. But it was, a, it was a wonderful, open invitation to all and was not inherently divisive. But there was still confusion, misunderstanding and even a, aggressive hostility. Satan blinds people to the light of the gospel of Christ. So saving faith is, a, is always a God thing. We need to pray for him to open blind eyes. The human heart, secondly, apart from God's grace, is helplessly, hopelessly incapacitated by sin. Pride is often the main sin that keeps people from Christ, as was true of these Pharisees. Learning and knowledge are good if they point you to the, to the majesty and the greatness of God. Humbling your heart. But they are dangerous if they lead you to pride over how much you know. Because they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. So salvation is always the gift of God's grace. Thirdly, expect to be ridiculed when you take a stand for Christ. Expect it. You'll be accused of being narrow-minded, bigoted, homophobic, anti-intellectual, unscientific, and probably more judgmental labels too. If they treated Jesus this way, they will treat his servants the same. Count it as an honour. Fourthly, people are quick to hide behind excuses rather than dig deeper in the search of truth that might threaten their worldview. People don't want to face their sin and their rebellion against God. So rather than investigating the truth about Jesus, they'd rather hide behind, behind flimsy excuses. You know, oh, evolution proves that the Bible is not true, or, or the, the Bible is full of contradictions. How can a good God allow innocent children, people to suffer? The list goes on. Because they don't want to, to look at the truth. Fifthly, Jesus does not allow neutrality. To be neutral is to be against him. These people who, who held favourable opinions about Jesus, you know, he is the prophet, he is the Christ, were on the side of truth. But there was no indication that they were committed to him. Nicodemus would eventually come out of, yeah, come out of the closet for Christ. I'll use that comment. Come out of the closet for Christ. So must you and I. Jesus warns us in, in Mark 8, verse 38. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in his glory of his Father with the holy angels. But he promises the suffering church in Smyrna and us in, in Revelation 2 verse 10. He says this, be faithful unto death and I will give you the crown of life. Be faithful. 
be faithful. Let's sing, shall we, our last hymn this morning. Tell out my soul the greatness of the Lord. Let's stand and sing together. Let me pray as we close. Almighty Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Lord Jesus. We thank you for his teaching. We thank you for this great invitation that he gave to come to him, those who are thirsty. And Lord, as we then see the, the confusion and the division that arose, Lord, we just pray that you will, you will break through uh, deaf ears and blind eyes and draw people to yourself. Draw people to the Lord Jesus, we pray. Help us to stand firm. Lord, help us to, to face ridicule for the gospel. Help us to be salt and light in this sinful generation, we pray, so that your name will be lifted high and your name glorified among the nations, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>